Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be together here in this amazing desert. I've spent 35, 36 years coming to this desert, often a month or more a year. So it's especially in the spring, sometimes in the autumn as well. Um, so it feels like getting back home when I see the jackrabbits and hear the owls and lizards and find the nests and the, the cactus wren nests and the choya. Um, we're joined this morning also by another teacher who will be happily working with you this week, Trudy Goodman, who is the um, founder of Insight LA and um, teaches at Spirit Rock and IMS and been a practitioner of both Vipassana and Zen and Tibetan and other things for, I don't know, forever, 30, 40 years, something, a long time. So I'm very glad she's here too. And this morning's theme is uh, creativity. So I'll introduce it and talk some about it. And then as we do in DPP, there are a variety of practices to do um, that we'll share together. And I want to begin by t talking about <clears throat> creativity as an aspect of liberation or freedom, because it's really what we're doing here together. It's one thing to study the texts or to do various practices or come on retreat um, and learn the Dharma tradition and, and so forth. Um, but of course, the most important thing, the kind of communication and communion, um, is to experience it, to embody it, to, to discover it in your own heart and mind and being. And of course, the essence of the Buddhist teaching is that of liberation, that the heart it can be free, the mind can be free, wherever we are in whatever circumstance. When Nelson Mandela walked out of Robben Island prison after 27 years with such graciousness and magnanimity and forgiveness and um, dignity. He not only changed South Africa, but really changed the imagination of the world. Um, that your spirit, that your body can be put in prison, but your spirit is always free. And it's that um, underlying truth that is central to Dharma practice. That's what the Buddha taught again and again, the freedom of spirit. Um, and it is, um, it is really what creativity is about. So we'll talk about creativity in, as an aspect of liberation. And when you read the Buddhist texts and so forth, sometimes they seem there are accounts of lots of dialogues that happen. The Buddha, you know, somebody coming up and asking him questions and for his teaching. But they're also full of creativity and poetry and art. Um, and uh, if you look in the Pali Canon, the words for liberation, just for Nibbana or Nirvana alone, the everlasting, the invisible, the deathless, the supreme blessing, the marvelous, the safety, purity, the island, the harbor, the shelter, the deathless, the true law, the beyond, freedom from bondage, unshakable stillness, the unoriginated, the highest happiness. And it goes on and on. And the first words that the Buddha uttered after his enlightenment, so the story is told anyway, were a poem. O house builder, thou art seen at last. The ridge pole is shattered, the rafters broken. No 
longer will you build this house of separation, this house of sorrow. Freed am I. It was a work of art, the first expression. Or you read one of my favorite texts, the Avatamsaka Sutra, the flower ornament sutra of 25 volumes in the Mahayana. And it talks about universes um, made of stones, universes made of fire, universes made of perfume, universes made of garlands and flowers. It's the, it's the wildest imagination that India ever produced almost. It's quite fantastic. Where every grain of sand, sand in the Ganges has a million atoms and each one is a vast universe and Buddhas arise in each atom of that universe and then it starts to give you the names of all those Buddhas and how the holy truths are spoken no matter whether it's fire or flowers or stone or um, uh, universes made of uh, dreams, all the kinds of universes, um, they all carry the same holy truths um, in the the, the holy, the first noble truth is called the, in, in one world is called the truth of oppression, in another it's called thorns, in another it's called ultimate vanity, and in another it's called carbuncles, the first noble truth. <laughs> or the c conduct of the ignorant, or conflagration, or the demise, and it just goes on and on in every universe. There's a million names for the suffering. But in all these different universes, there are also the truths of 40 trillion names. This is the kind of numbers that it uses, right? Um, of, of liberation. Um, uh, let's see. So uh, it's called um, uh, security beyond all things. <clears throat> or the taming and subduing of life, <clears throat> or free from offense, or um, forever at peace, or the limitless joy, um, or the true meaning. And it goes on and on and on and on. Um, here we are born into these human bodies in this mysterious this mysterious process we call incarnation, in which spirit takes form somehow, you know, through the sex of your mommy and daddy. Bizarre, isn't it? You're going to hear more about that later today. It's another part of creativity. Trudy's going to talk about that. I don't know about your parents, but somehow about that. Um, and you came to be. Now you know that you're more than just the sex that your mommy and daddy had. You're well aware of that, of course, you can feel it. But here you are in this body with these incredibly sensitive organs of ears and eyes and skin. And of course, sensitivity means both that you can see and hear and smell, and also that you feel pain and sorrow, and that you feel beauty and taste the tangerine and see the luminescent colors of the sunset. Um, and so to be liberated in this bioregion of human incarnation um, means also to recognize that life itself is this creative act and that you are this creative act. Just as your spirit can be free, no one, they can put your body in prison but not your spirit. Every moment of your life in the the malleability and pliancy of consciousness itself, which is, gives birth to all things, um, is the place of liberation. So when you understand creativity, it's not just, can I write a poem, you know, or do I have a hobby um, painting still lifes, but that you are creativity, and that creativity is a dimension of your freedom. And it can never be taken from you. You can forget it. Or you can get into the delusion that it's not there. But you are the center. It's like the hologram. Every piece has information about the whole in it. You can take a hologram and just take a little piece of it, project the laser light through it, and the entire image will come. 
You contain everything. And it's all possible through and in you. And so then creativity is more, how do we allow ourselves to navigate the joys and sorrows of human incarnation with a free spirit and, a, and an open heart, like a Buddha that you are? How do you navigate with compassion and response to what's there rather than the fixed patterns of fear and suffering and, and clinging? How do you express your liberation in your life? Because your meditation practice itself is a creative act. When we give you the metta phrases, how many of you do exactly the stock metta phrases that you heard and haven't changed them? <laughs> it fits. I mean, that's, that's beautiful, you know, because it's the right, it's the right, it's the right um, creative act for you to do. Everybody else changed them because that also was the right thing. Or maybe somebody didn't tell you you could change them. I don't know. <laughs> Um, how many of you do the Vipassana instruction according to Mahasi Saido or Ubakin or Utejini or Ajahn Chah or Ajahn Damodaro? You all mess with it and fiddle with it, you know? You do. It's a constant creative process, isn't it, of how to be present and how to find the space of liberation where you are. So it's a continuous creative act, your life. So one year here in the desert, a man came to a series of his interviews or meetings. Trudy and I were working with him. And he seemed, acted, looked, and then described himself as pretty depressed. And he was a, let's see, what shall I call him? He, was, he worked as a kind of physical therapist in the hospital in, um, in a unit in, in Ohio, make up that part of it anyway. Um, and uh, he was sitting and walking and come in and didn't look that great. And then he came in one day and see if, how much of the story I can remember. Um, and he talked about how much was pent up inside. You know that? You ever notice that? Unfinished stuff. And somewhere in the conversation, he mentioned the werewolf. And as he said it, I could kind of see a little glint of that in uh, his eyes. So it's a lot pent up. And I said, well, you know, maybe you want to let the werewolf out a little bit to find out who's, who's in there or how that got in there or something called locked inside, right? And, and of course, you think I'm telling a story about some guy sitting here on retreat, which is true. But if you go into almost any great temple in Thailand or Burma, you don't have to go to Tibet where they have all those insanely wild demons and things. They have them all around Burma and Thailand and all through Theravada Buddhism. You have to pass through the two demons that guard the gates of the temple, the yakshas with their fierce, protective, you know, wild energy and clubs and weapons. I mean, this is, you know, this is you. Not just this guy, but it's life energy. So anyway, at some point in our working, I said, well, you know, let's have a little dialogue with the werewolf, right? Let's find out what this energy is inside. So we did a little conversation. Um, and the werewolf says, um, I said, why don't you ask the werewolf what it wants? And the werewolf said, it was locked in a cage, it said, He wanted his heart. Hmm? It wanted what? Your meat? Meat heart. I want your meat heart. Something like that. You know, it was, it was a werewolf. Right. Thanks, Trudy. I want your meat heart. So he said, I'm not going to let that thing out, right? And we worked for a while, a couple more. It was a long retreat. And I said, well, you know, send some metta, compassion to it. And finally, like, all right, um, there came this session where he said, all right, I'm going to open 
the get the ore and let it let it out. And when the werewolf, when he opened the door inside, the werewolf straightened up, walked out, walked right by him, brushed him in this very sweet way, like a dog, and communicated that when it wanted his heart, what it meant was it wanted his love. And he let him let it touch, let him touch it, and it walked out free into the desert. And then he began to weep. And I said, so what is this werewolf? And he said, oh, we lived in a you know, farming country, out in the country. And we had a kind of a, a farm outside this town. And when people had animals that they didn't want too many puppies or things like that, they'd drop them off um, out at our gate. Because we were the farm. We had all these other animals. And we'd take care of them. Um, but we couldn't. And he said, so he said, I love dogs. Um, but my dad, when I start, turned seven or eight, he made me take the rifle and shoot each one. He said, between the time I was seven or eight and 13 when I stopped, I killed 14 dogs. And then he just started to weep because he loves animals. So this is really what he was carrying. So we talked about making amends in some way, making some ritual that would help heal him. And then some days later, he came to see me and Trudy and said, um, come out to the desert with me at twilight. And I talked to him about creating a ritual in some way, I gave him some instructions, just very, very simple ones. And we walked out across the desert as the light was getting very low. And he took us out in the hills and he said, can you see the direction we're going? He said, that's Sirius, the dog star. And he made this altar in the hills that was a mandala of stones for those 14 dogs, um, oriented towards Sirius, the dog star. And put a flower by each stone and took us out. And in the center, there was a large stone and a little one next to it. And he said, that was the mother with her puppies. And even after I shot her, she tried to move her body in the way so that I couldn't harm her puppy. And he's just weeping. And he, one by one, asked their forgiveness. And then he said, and I need to make amends. And I will give for the next 10 years $500 a year to the, you know, the local shelter. Um, I'll never pass a dog that's been abused and not help it. And um, I'll volunteer, you know, a day a month down in the, for the vet or the shelter or something. It was really, it was the, he had to make some atonement for his soul in some way. And we felt this tremendous privilege just to be with him as he did it and he came back. There was another altar that another yogi and friend made who'd been working for the Dalai Lama and the United Nations getting the stories of Tibetans who had escaped Tibet, the old ones recording them. And she carried that in her heart. And she made an altar and placed a stone on the altar to honor every one story that she'd heard. So you start to hear that practice is a creative act. Does this make sense to you? In some way, it's a way to bear the sorrows and the magnificent beauty of the world and to find a, a liberation in the midst of it. And of course, our education is a very rote education system. It doesn't really teach us to think. And it doesn't really teach us to be ourselves so well. And so we forget that creativity is what we are. We are awareness. We are loving awareness expressing itself through this life. After the 9-11 towers fell in New York, people walked around in a trance and in a trauma. This is written by a professor at the School of the Arts at Columbia. And he said, I would pass them, this, the, the, the sculptors and the artists and professors, and they'd say, it all feels so absurd. What's the point to making art in time like this? 
You can sort of imagine that, right? Teach my class on art. To which I was stunned and couldn't answer any more than I could have answered if he'd been, or they'd been arguing about the redundancy of breathing. What could I say that in June 1945, workers reclaiming the prisons in Buchenwald found poems folded into thick squares stuffed into the electrical wiring. A person locked in the cell awaiting their death would choose to write a poem on a piece of toilet paper so that their spirit facing death would never die. So as we join the Dharma stream of liberation, um, it unlocks our ability to be responsive, to be creative, to move in any way we can with the energy of life. And the great teachers that I've been with um, have often, not always, well, they've often been playful, but they've also been um, They've all been creative. They've all been mavericks, actually, in their own way. Buddha Dasa and Mahasi and Sayadaw and Ajahn Chah and Ubakin and the ones that we see, the great Theravada elders, they all did it differently, every one of them. And that expressed the sense that they are freedom, emptiness, that everything is born out of emptiness, and that through creative spirit, we can move and shape our life, not always our circumstance. We have our karma. You were born into a certain culture and a certain body and so forth. But given the palate, you can do anything. And that's really the third noble truth of non-clinging, of becoming the loving awareness um, that is free. And here's the Buddha. His first expression is a poem. A little girl whose mother works at the university, she's headed out the door, again working in the art department, like in that last story. She's like four years old, and she says, Mommy, when you go to university to teach, what do you do? And she says, well, I, I teach people how to paint and draw. The little girl looks at her and says, you mean they forget? <laughs> How about that? Because it is you. You are cre creativity. And as you join your life in the Dharma stream, it becomes a display, a dance, a show, um, an expression, that you understand emptiness, that you're not just your conditioning, that who you are is not your body. That's not the culture or the race or the, those are all conditions that you need to express, but it's the unconditioned spirit. John Ciardi, poet, puts it this way. He says, an ulcer is an unkissed imagination taking its revenge for having been jilted. It's an undanced dance, an unpainted watercolor, an unwritten poem. So liberation isn't far away, and it's not at the end of a long retreat or found in the forests of Burma or the caves of the Himalayas. It's exactly where you are. Every atom of every universe of flower garlands and scents and perfumes and stone and fire, and your body contains the Buddha nature of both delusion and separateness and the, the, the holy truth of liberation and freedom. And so if you go to those temples, because we took, unfortunately, the kind of East Coast, Ivy League-educated intellectual Jews like you know, Goldstein, Salzburg, um, Cornfield, and Schwartz, the founders of IMS, the, the law firm, right? We took, you know, the kind of 
dry intellectual sit and walk and don't look at anybody practice because that was like the deepest you know, thing we could find, we thought. Meanwhile, not noticing that that was about 2% of Theravada Buddhism that you're studying. And the rest of it is held in temples that are filled with paintings of demons and angels and realms um, that are all an expression of our inner life, as well as the mystery that you're born into. Um, temples that had music and festivals and, 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 and dance um, and creativity. And there's the text where the Buddha is standing with Ananda at the top of a hillside and says, look down in the spring now that the rains have come and the fields have these new um, beautiful chartreuse green sprouts, colors, and the patterns. Could we, he says to Ananda, could we make the patches of our monk's robes match the beauty of those fields. And so when you look at the monks' robes, there are these little patches and then big ones and little ones like the dikes in the rice paddies. That's the Buddha's artistic eye. We're making our robes out of rags, out of death shrouds, thrown away cloth. But let's bring beauty into it. How's that for a marriage? Beauty in, even in, in death. And of course, then there's all those Zen death poems, you know, the Zen master writes at the end of life, my body, a drop of dew grown heavy at the leaf tip. Says so much. Though I live to be a hundred, the same spring breeze, the same cherry blossoms. Something eternal. Oh, they did. Oh, you already did that. Good. <laughs> By coming and going, two simple happenings that got entwined. Or how about this one? This is from Isa, great Zen poet. Dew evaporates, and all our world is dew. So dear, so refreshing, so fleeting. This was written on the death of his daughter. Hear it again now. Dew evaporates and all our world is dew. So dear, so refreshing, so fleeting. And I know it myself. I mean, I'm in a time of a lot of my own life change. Um, had all this neurological problems that now seem to have abated considerably, but they really make me aware of my mortality and coming to 67 and not knowing how my body's going to fall apart. Notice I say how, you know, rather than that. I mean, really getting it. Or separating after 30 years of marriage. And I go, well, who am I, you know? Um, and having to, in some way, make my life anew with a lot of tears and a lot of possibility, um, all the feelings that come, the old way, and yet life won't stop for you, baby. It won't, will it? And so either you get with the creative program or you get dragged by the creative program because it's what's happening. <laughs> It is life force. It is, and to expand our practice to express this, I'm just babbling on, but it seems somehow important to set the frame for what we do here. Is your dharma. We are life. It's like um, Brian Swim, the cosmologist, said, you know, 4.5 billion years ago, the earth was a ball of flaming molten rock, and now it can sing opera. <laughs> and that's you. You are this earth it, 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 in physical form, and this weave of life and spirit. Thomas Merton, amazing writer, poet, mystic, 
He said, if you write for God, you will reach many men and women and bring them joy. If you write for what's holy or sacred. If you write for men and women, you may make some money and give someone a little joy and you make a noise in the world for a little while. And if you write for your own self-promotion, you can read what you yourself have written and after 10 minutes, you'll be so disgusted you'll wish that you were dead. <laughs> And you can feel in it somehow what it, the creative spirit, that's the spirit, creativity is liberation. And so it's not creativity as, oh, you know, um, look at me, a kind of egotistical creativity. I, I don't want to be judgmental about that. I almost never use the word ego. It's just small self. But the creativity that we're speaking of in DPP is, is the expression of your liberation. It's so much bigger and more beautiful. And of course, you know, it got shut down. I mean, another interview I had, I can think of all these times here. There was a woman who came to a old student's retreat. And um, she didn't like the group. The, we had the group interviews at first. And she said, let me see if I, I wrote down her words at one point. Um, she just stayed silent. She, then she said she was really shy, but it's really, it's difficult when I have to relate to people. I love being silent on retreats. It's the relationship part that's hard. Um, I know this is just, part of it's just my nature, but part of it is the pain of my family. I can't stand to have anyone's eyes on me. And so as we talked, she closed her eyes so she would feel safe in the group. And saying anything to the group was terrifying. When I asked her how long it had been this way, it was as early as she could remember. She said, my parents were always watching me, scowling, annoyed, angry, filled with judgment. I have no memories of it ever being another way. Feel that. And as she continued to be attentive to her experience, she wept, her eyes closed. And I said, can you find any safe place in your body? since the group wasn't safe. There was none, she said. Not, a, not even a little, you know, edge of the finger. No safe place in her body. All right, I said, can you remember from your childhood a single instant of well-being? It took her a while. Finally, she opened her eyes, rubbed the palm of her hand, and said, crayons. She smiled. She remembered being five years old and holding a box of crayons. I suggested, well, then you could draw with them. She said, no. No, no, anything I draw, they'll criticize me. I'm only safe when I hold them. How's that? So when the group was over, I went actually out to the drugstore down by Vaughn's, and I bought one of those great big 64-color Crayola things, and I brought it back to her. Um, and I put it in her hands, and she was like beginning to weep. She didn't know what to do with it. And I imagined, I said, hold the little girl with the box of crayons in your heart. And I said, now, if no one was looking, what would happen next? And with her eyes closed, her face lit up. She threw out her arms, and she said, I would hold them and dance like a fairy princess. That's what I always wanted to be. I said, we'll take them and make a dance. Later, she gave me, gave me a drawing. So it's locked in there, but no one can take it from you. It's your, your life is your creative spirit. And oh, the, the poems, the songs of the, the nuns and the, you know, the, the enlightened stream of art. Mirabai in India, who's got the proposal from this great emir or someone, you know, who was entranced by her ecstasy and beauty and wanted to make her his wife and to share in all he owned. And he said, I am not interested, she wrote back, I'm not interested in sharing all that you own, in owning anything nor being owned by anyone. And you know how it was in those days. I have taken the path that ecstatic human beings have taken for thousands of years. 
I felt the swaying of the elephant's shoulders, and now you want me to ride on a jackass? <laughs> Try to be serious. Yours, Mira. She just couldn't shrink down. <laughs> so sometimes it's that way. Sometimes, oh, well, there are all these ways that it just needs help to be expressed. This doctor who wrote, you know, that he really didn't want to be a doctor. He wanted to be a concert pianist. He was a surgeon. Someone was complimenting him on how the artistry of his surgery. And he said, I, I can tell you why. He said, because I woke up at 5 this morning and played Chopin, Chopin for an hour and a half at the piano. And then the surgery goes well. This from Alice Walker where she writes, I think it pisses God off if you walk by the color purple in a field somewhere and don't notice it. People think pleasing God is all God care about, but any fool living in the world can see it's always trying to please you back. Or Walt Whitman who writes, as for me, I see nothing but miracles. I walk the streets of Manhattan or stand under the trees in the woods and look at strangers in the car and watch honeybees around the hive and animals feeding in the fields and the wonderfulness of insects in the air and the delicate thin curve of the new moon and spring and every hour of light and dark is a miracle and every cubic inch of space is a miracle and every square yard of the surface of the earth is spread with miracles and the running blackberry would adorn the parlors of heaven and a mouse is miracle enough to stagger sextillions of infidels. What a line. A mouse is miracle enough to stagger sextillions of infidels. It's so amazing. And it comes out of emptiness. It comes out of nothing. The vast cosmos, you know, if you get a picture of the solar system and you see that the sun were the size of, I don't know, a grapefruit or something like that. Pluto would be like the size of a grain of sand and would be, you know, 100 miles, you know, on the edge of Kansas or I don't know, somewhere way on the other side of the country. It's insane. And all the rest is just vast space that we're hurling through that creates these flaming balls of light, of billions of stars, and somehow you congealed out of that. You are congealed starlight, basically. Wild. So, all right, I'd like us to do a guided meditation. Um, just be five minutes or so. No such thing as not a creative person. Martha Graham, there's a vitality, a life force that's translated into you in action. And because there is only one of you in all of time, this expression is unique. And if you stop it, block it, it will never exist in any other medium and be lost. Open the gates. Let yourself be free. So close your eyes and sit quietly for a moment. And this is a little guided meditation, an invitation in another form to be in touch with your own creative spirit, the muse within you. Remember a time in your life when you felt most alive. Remember it, picture it, imagine it. When you felt so full with aliveness. And remember how this creative aliveness felt in your body. And remember how this creative aliveness was experienced in the heart and mind. And if your creative spirit could move and dance, if your creative spirit could move your body to dance, what kind of dance would it be? 
a polka or a ballet or a break dance or dancing on a surfboard. Let yourself know, envision, imagine how your spirit would move. And what kind of music loosens up your spirit? Rap or rock and roll or opera or country western? Blues? Indian flute music? Heavy metal? Hear it, imagine it. Let your spirit smile. And if your creative spirit could make movies, what kind of movies would it make? Action movies? Tragedies? Romantic comedy? Documentaries? What are the movies your spirit would make? to express its joy and freedom and liberation. And if the liberated spirit in you could sing, what would it sound like? And if the liberated spirit in you could express its freedom in pictures and images, if it could draw and paint, what would this liberated spirit paint or draw? What colors and forms? And finally, let yourself picture or imagine that you could walk out from this room out into the desert and find a place further back where there are the hills and rocks and go around the corner to a place you haven't seen before and there is a scene or a vision and a gift for you. And as you go around the corner, it will be a scene that displays your own liberated spirit in some way. And waiting for you there will be a gift, a clear symbol of just what you need for your life to express liberation through the creative spirit. And see this gift, this package, this present that the muses have left for you, and open it and, and let yourself see this clear symbol of just what you need so that your liberated spirit and inner liberation can express itself fully in your life.